standing up in McKinney. This is According to Callus, coming to you on the 3rd of July, the year of our Lord, 2024. It is episode 665, <laughs> and I have no idea <laughs> what I'm going to call it. We'll probably just go with independence is yours. All right, in any case, uh, before we get into the meat of the day, let me make uh, an observation. <laughs> I was supposed to do 663. Uh, last Friday, that didn't happen. So I immediately picked up with 664 on Monday and I saw my error. So for the record, episode 663 does not exist. However, for grins, perhaps over the long weekend, I'll go back and create an episode 663 if for no other reason, just my own entertainment. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, let me remind you before we get to the show like sharing and subscribe makes the difference. The algorithms have been, uh, let's just say not helpful. I I'd like to say I'm important enough to be shadow banned. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't understand what's going on otherwise, but we can overcome it. We can work together. We can make a difference and we can be heard. Uh, the, the changes, right? The changes that are in play, require me to do three episodes a week. I'm going to do my darndest to make them about 45 minutes long to make it worth your time to join in. And today we're going to talk about the Brexit, the Mexit, and uh, <laughs> European breakout, right? Um, and then a couple of books that I'm working through um, and how they kind of sort of fit together. And with that, here we go on with the program. <laughs> Oh, and in case I forgot to say it, yes, I have a page and a group over at Facebook. I'm a pro at Gab. I drop in at MeWe, and apparently still you can find my program over at YouTube. All right, so as you may be aware, I'm a fan of Texit, right? I, I think that, well, let's put it this way. I think absolutely we the people have a right to decide whether or not we want to remain part of the United States, these United States, the union, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to hear that it didn't work out so well before we're going to hear that this has been settled. Uh, no, no, it hasn't. And I have from time to time talked about the different ways and means this might come about, but the bigger picture is here. These United States would not exist if it wasn't for a previous Brexit. What am I talking about? 1776, 1776, baby. You had the uh, Lee Resolution, which passed in July the 2nd, 1776, followed by the D Declaration of Independence in its entirety, which rolled out on July the 4th, 1776. These were the precursor moves and documents that brought about our United States as we currently know it. It started out as three independent colonies, which became three independent states. They came together as a union to work together. They formed the Articles of Confederation, which they utilized to break free from Great Britain, and it existed through the War of Independence. So Brexit, 1776... Um, I don't know what else you would call that other than an independence movement, a war of secession, right? And here we are. So I find it disappointing that we celebrate independence day on July the 4th. And we don't understand that <laughs> this is the tagline treason is the reason for the season. <laughs> you know, I don't know that, uh, we would be called patriots had we not been successful. I mean, if you look at Canada, there's still a dominion and Canada is far further down the road to socialism, right? The, the road to serfdom, if you will, than we are in these United States. Unfortunately, the distance, the gap between the two of us on that road seems to be narrowing, not because they're slowing down, but because we've decided to speed up. Now I know the Supreme court SCOTUS, if you will, has found a number of key decisions, right? Opinions that would seem to buttress these United States as a ongoing concern 
They've reeled back some of the deep states, some of the abuses of power. And strangely, some people I know, some people I actually know in real life are fretting over the fact that there's going to be something called presidential immunity. Well, just to clarify, that immunity is really no different than what the police have. Now, I will be the first to tell you, I have some qualms about the same kind of immunity given for police, prosecutors, and judges. I have some concerns about that, but I certainly understand why it exists. I certainly understand the use of it and why it might be there, though I have some concerns. It seems to me that All the more so, the guy that is the leader of the executive branch ought to be free from prosecution, from doing things that would be part of his job or her job, if we should ever have a female president. So other things are prosecutable. And interestingly enough, if they should actually be impeached and then convicted, you can go after them for those same things. So no, it isn't going to lead to abuse of power. Now, I got to be honest, there's a part of me that kind of wishes the kind of wishes uh, there are some (laughs) a large number of folks that would like nothing better than destroy our country. And I could envision such a future where perhaps they take those folks on helicopter rides. Just saying, not that I would encourage violence. I don't think that's a good idea, but sometimes you are left with no other option. And I don't know that we're there yet. You'd have to win that first. Well, (laughs) in any case, so yes, why does this matter? Well, If you keep in mind, historically, there was a Mexit in 1836. Yeah, Mexit. That's where Texas broke free. The Texas Republic came into being roughly 60 years after the original colonies broke free from Great Britain. They broke away from the Empire of Mexico. And they became their own republic. Now, there were issues to be sure. But but Sam Houston, you know, he had faith. uh, And the folks that were here kind of tried to do their own thing and they uh, they ran into some problems and they allowed themselves to be mm, courted into a marriage with these United States. And while it was good for a while, then they got embroiled in the war of secession, right? The war between the states. And you could say they chose the wrong side, in this case, the losing side, not so much the wrong side ideology. Ideologically, how about there? You can make lots of arguments, but for a single issue, the South was ahead of the game. But again, I'm not trying to justify something that happened in 1860. What I'm trying to do is get you to wrap your head around the idea that There was an independence movement that was successful in 1776. There was another one that was successful in 1836. Sadly, the independence movement of 1860 was not as successful. Now, where does that leave us now? Well, we need to decide which is more important. Being an empire or being free? Being a giant military power that scares and um, (laughs) bullies other countries around the world or an independent and free nation? I would suggest to you, you really can't have both. You're going to have to pick one over the other. There isn't a clear delineation of where that line is, but clearly what we're doing is not working and it's not working out in our best interests. As the empire comes to its end, things happen. Usually not good things. As they break apart, they unexpected things happen. Other civil wars, if you will, other battles for con- control, other coups. Some would say we're already living through a coup. What does that mean to you, right? Well, right now we're watching some things play out in England, in Europe as a whole, right? There's these elections going on and the nationalists, you know, that boogeyman, that, uh, that negative word are pushing back a little, a little on the globalists. Now, to be clear, I don't think the nationalists of 2020 something are the same as the nationalists of the 1940s, but I think the globalists have been the same all along. The globalists seem to think that 
you're not worthy, that you should be controlled. And anything and everything that they do in order to bring that about is acceptable, allowable, agreeable, and ought to be. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not on board with that. I don't think that's something that I'm interested in. That's not something that I want to participate in. That's not something that we, the people of these United States, signed up for. You know, there's a great number of people that volunteered to serve their country over the last, I don't know, let's say, I'm 50, north of 50 now. Let's just say there's a great number of people in the last 50 years that willingly signed to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What was intrinsically part of that deal is we're doing this to protect our families, whether it would be our spouse, in most cases a wife, and or children or future children or posterity if you prefer. We, we took that oath and we took it seriously. Unfortunately, the vast majority of us went to sleep when we got out. We got free. We just checked out. We went and did our regular job, raised a family, just let the world pass us by. Now I've been here for a couple of years trying to wake people up, trying to reassert that, you know, that oath doesn't have an expiration date. And the fact of the matter is it's at all enemies, foreign and domestic. So when we're dealing with domestic enemies that seek to usurp and abuse the constitutional constraints that were put upon them, and they want to take more power than which was ever granted them, and they want to abuse us and abuse our families, perhaps we ought to be paying attention. Perhaps we ought to consider what do we do about it? And there's a whole lot of things we got to do or think about before things go kinetic. And again, just to be clear, I'm not advocating any kinetic response at this time. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think it would go well if we were to do that. And certainly there's going to be some knucklehead somewhere that's going to go do something without thinking it through. Right now, the entirety of everything is arrayed against us. We, the people, don't matter. Even those that are willing stooges, those that go along to get along, those that claim to be on the right side of history, they are what progressives, leftists, socialists refer to as useful idiots. Yeah, you, perhaps you don't like me saying that. Perhaps you think that's mean or unfair, but their very leadership describes them as that. I mean, you can look no further than a book that I've referenced, oh, just a few times, right? Rules for Radicals. Their whole method for gaining power and taking power and controlling power is to maintain control over a bunch of manipulable people. The problem is both sides of the dichotomy are extremely manipulatable. I would say that to a degree, everybody gets manipulated on a daily basis. It's just a degree and what actions come about because of it. I mean, I still find myself from time to time listening to talk radio. And you hear that host or the speaker repeat the same thing three times. They do that on purpose so you'll remember it. I've done it a time or two so you'll remember it. You might hear it say something along those lines. The British abused their power. The British, they were abusing their power. Let me hear you one more time, folks. The British abused their power. So we, the colonists, had to throw them off. See how that's done? It's a common thing. It shouldn't be a surprise to you. I, I, I check out mentally when I hear it because I just understand that it's part of the programming. Now, I sometimes I want to remember what they're saying just so I understand what the messaging is. But, it, but it's interesting, right? The other thing that, that people understand and when they're being manipulated, they should note this. Most of the human mind, if you will, has been trained to only pick up on something in less than, I don't know, two, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. There's a reason why TikTok is successful. There's a reason why short form responses, Twitter is successful. Now I realize I'm probably altering uh, my own success going from a roughly 30 minute podcast to trying to do about 40, 45 minutes. And only doing it three times a week as opposed to five. 
But look, I, I'm <laughs> a middling talent, if you will, at this. I have some minor successes. I My income is not dependent on this. So I feel free to do certain things and experiment. And one of those things is I try and speak the truth, or at least the truth as I understand it, or I know it, or I've read it. And it's up to you, dear listener, to check me, to make sure I've got it right, to make sure that your understanding tracks with mine, to make sure that I didn't go off on a <laughs> overly, uh, <laughs> boy, I want to say something, but I'm not. let's just say I didn't go off on a tangent that was destructive. Now, what does that mean? We're watching what's playing out in Europe. None of that is happening without consequences. None of that is happening without people knowing what's going on. And, you know, these great heroes that win election all too often turn out to be big nothings. I recall the guy that ran for, um, I think it's the Italian prime minister or whatever the title is. And he was going to fix things, right? And he promptly got elected and said, no, 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 we don't have enough immigration. We, we need to bring in more Africans. That's going to fix everything. Now, once again, you might want to read into it some kind of racial thing here. No, it's culture. It's a cultural thing, right? If the cultures clash, you're going to have problems, right? Proximity creates war. I wish I could create credit for that phrase. Um, the first time I ever saw it, um, and, and, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but the first time I ever saw it was a guy by the name of Vox Day. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Very insightful guy. Whether or not I agree with him, very insightful, very often right way before you even see it coming. So I'm not going to dismiss that guy. I'm not going to attack him. Extremely helpful to see in some of the bigger picture items, especially when you get it ahead of time. Okay. So he thinks Europe's redeemable. He thinks Europe can bounce back. There's, I think he said, 660 Europeans, legitimate Europeans, right? Not, not Muslim transplants, not African transplants, but actual European Europeans. And if they just start having a couple of kids each, they could turn it around in 15 to 30 years. I think that's a very interesting way of looking at it. So then I transplant that idea into these United States. One of the things that we're told and being sold is because our people, right? The native born people, and I'm going to, it's tempting to just say white people but that's not true either it's or it's not entirely accurate if you will i would say the vast majority of the entirety of the population of the united states is not reproducing now the right-wing christians yeah they reproduce some of the irresponsible rural people right we're gonna we're gonna and <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't even say irresponsible. Let's just say there are some people in rural areas as well as high urban areas that have lots of children but don't necessarily raise them. How about that? <laughs> I, and, I, and I want to be accurate without being a jerk about it. There, there are, you know, certain groups and certain subgroups that have lots of children. But as a whole, we're at like 1.6 ch children or 1.6 child. I don't even know how you say that. Less than two children per per married adults. How about that? Or per adults. The reproduction rate is lower than what it is to replacement. So the solution naturally is we're going to just bring in the rest of the world here. Well, that would be fine if they would adapt to the American culture. It would be fine if, I don't know, they wanted to become Americans. But from what I've seen, they really don't. And when I say the term American, I fully realize there's a huge difference between a Californian, a Yankee, a Texan, a Floridian, and quite frankly, most Midwesterners. There's huge differences amongst us. But at the end of the day, we all speak some form of English. We all understand each other. Uh, we might have different skin tones and different tenors of speaking, but we're generally on the same page. And most of the time, we kind of like the stars and stripes. Just saying. And a good deal of us don't get offended easily. Unfortunately, we've had about two different generations after me uh, that it, 
they've been trained up to be offended at every little thing and to get upset at every little thing and basically hate themselves if they're white, if they're male, and if they're straight. Now, I'm not sure why we allowed that and tolerated it because it really isn't working out so well for us, but that's the world we live in. We have to accept it and understand it and deal with it. So now here's where it gets interesting. When we're talking about how do we deal with it, right? We accept that Europe is <laughs> being subsumed and the United States is under attack. And while perhaps you might make an argument that Texas could go its own way and rebound, sure. Perhaps it would be better to say these United States, even as disunited states, could get their act together and rebound. I like that better. Perhaps you could indicate that North America as a whole could put itself into a much better position if they would just decide that one man and one woman getting together and having a family and having children is a good way to go forward um, as long as they remember they were created that way by God and they choose to worship the one triune God. Just saying, just saying. All right, so how does this fit together? You, you, you talked about all these negative things. You've talked about some oh, scary stuff and, and you, you kind of been a little edgy there. Well, not really. I really tamed a lot of that down. So I started working my way through the book of Nehemiah in the Bible. Now I've read it a time or two in the past and I've listened to it on the audio, you know, Bible in a year app at least three or four times in the last couple of years. So I'm vaguely familiar with what's going on in Nehemiah before I even open up the book. When I say vaguely familiar, let's just say I understand the story. By the story, I mean the narrative of what's playing out and that the uh, prophet Nehemiah, who is a cupbearer to the leader of the empire of Persia, Artaxerxes to be exact, is, is, which in is a cupbearer, um, I know in modern connotations, we don't think that means a whole lot, but it means the king or the emperor, if you will, explicitly trusts this person. And they spend a lot of time around them because they basically test all their drink before they have it. There's a little bit of trust there, right? So he says to the king, look, Jerusalem has fallen on hard times. And Jerusalem is the homeland of my people, the Hebrews. I would like to go back there and I'd like to rebuild the walls. I'd, li- I'd like to put it back into shape. I'd like to make a difference. So that's how we open up. And then in uh, chapters two and three, it kind of talks about the process in which that happens. He shows up, he meets with different people and said, hey, we need to rebuild the walls. We need to put these gates back into working order. Each one of you take a section, start working on it, right? Make the difference basically in your own backyard. And that's just in the first three chapters, it lays that out. Now there's more to follow and I will probably reference that later on. But the the key takeaway for me is fix the thing directly near you. Take your one piece that you can make an impact and get it done. Now, he asks them to consider why and their motivations, which in the context of the early Hebrews um, is an act of worship. It's an act of reverence for uh, Jerusalem as a, as a whole. I mean, David's gone. It's fallen down to hard times. What do we, what do we do? How, how is God going to show favor on us? Right? So they're looking at this as a act of worship, as an act of obedience, if you will. So now I, I think about this cause I'm working through this book and I picked up a book that I read years and years ago called point man by Steve Farrar. If you don't know who that guy is, he was a long-term men's pastor. Uh, He ended up, oddly enough, in Frisco, Texas at Stonebriar Church under uh, Chuck Swindoll's uh, leadership. And I had the great pleasure and honor to attend his uh, men's Bible study for probably the last, I don't know, six months of his ministry. The guy died, went home to the Lord, and I read this book probably 20 some years ago. I had no idea. The guy was in California at the time. So 
Go figure. I mean, we Stonebriar Church basically was created when Chuck Swindoll fled California. Let's put it that way. So the the first couple chapters of the book, he's just talking about these are the things, the destruction of the family. What are we going to do about it? What are you as men going to do about this? And I and I just went through the chapter where he talked about we have to save our boys. Boys become men, right? And how do we get good men if we don't invest them in them when they're boys? He talks about, you know, the breakdown of families, the breakdown of cultural families and, you know, the costs and how do we recover it? How do we come back from that? Now, granted, this book is at least 30 years old. I don't know. It might not have been written in 1994, but certainly from the mid nineties. Okay. But the idea is fix your family first, raise your boys first. Now he, he pauses and says, look, you're going to have daughters in this mix too. But ideally daughters are mostly raised by their mothers. Whereas the sons should be mostly raised by their fathers. That's how they learn to become mothers and fathers. That's how they learn to be good spouses. That's how they learn to be functioning adults. What's interesting is <laughs> I distinctly remember having a conversation with uh, my wife and a friend of hers, probably before I ever read this book. And I talked about the idea that in the pre-industrial age, men were at home with their families, whether they were farmers or, you know, mealmen or whatever. And they spent their time with their family and their sons would follow in their footsteps most of the time. And the daughters would follow in the mother's footsteps, but it was a family unit. And they had, I guess, what you would call an extended family in the area. So what's interesting is Steve Farrar actually picks up on this. And uh, I think it was chapter two, it might be chapter three, talking about the idea that the industrial revolution was actually the start of this problem because it took men out of the house. And look, we all have our different opinions of feminism and women in the workplace and all that other stuff. I don't, this is not a hill I'm going to die on. And it's not necessarily relevant to the point I'm trying to make here. So just set it aside, folks, please. The moment men left the house for eight to 10 hours a day, at least five or six days out of the week, there's this gap, there's this void. Now, interestingly enough, around the same time period, compulsory schooling comes into play, right? I think he actually referenced 1649 in Massachusetts. They started with a compulsory education, mostly to convert uh, Catholics to Protestantism, but be that as it may. The idea being they broke the family because a lot of men were forced to go to the factory and work. And do some kind of production. They couldn't do their, you know, home-born business. They couldn't do the farming. They were no longer an integral part of their family. Now, look, there are ways to overcome that. And he does talk about that. And that will come up later, I'm sure, in our conversations here. But the idea was, once that happened, and then it gets magnificently worse (laughs) when women hit the workforce, right? Because now both parents are leaving. But he's starting with this. And it also breaks the function of the husband and wife working together to get a goal, to get an outcome. Now, they come up with different goals. They come up with different ways to create more income and do more things and whatever else. But what's interesting to me is talked about the idea that if you can't raise your boys right, if you can't invest in your boys when they're young, they don't become good men. Now, granted, look, there's exceptions to the rule. I mean, all the all the, year, <laughs> all the usual provisos here, right? Look, we're talking as a gross generalization. So, yes, I don't need to hear any specifics. Just as a general idea, this is a net negative effect to both the family and the young men. And he actually references the different cultural differences breakdown in the uh, black community, which predates the breakdown in the white community, if you will. But 
hey, don't worry, we white folk are looking to narrow that gap. We can have as many uh, irresponsible men as possible. I'm just saying. Uh, and again, I'm not pointing a finger in judgment. I'm merely parodying and agreeing with an observation that was made over 30 years ago, that, to the best of my recollection, basically stating that the family got destroyed. And as the family got destroyed, it became more destroyed. And the more destroyed it gets, the worse off the young men are. And when the young men are messed up, guess what? Women get messed up too. Daughters get messed up. Wives get messed up. So the idea is, how do we fix men? Well, you invest in them when they're young children. In other words, the parallel to this is, you're fixing the wall, metaphorically, in your own backyard by fixing your children. Now I look at this and I have two grown daughters and I wish I could tell you I was an awesome dad. I wish I could tell you my daughters adore me and think the world of me. I want to have husbands that are just like me. I mean, to a degree that's accurate. I failed. I've done lots of stupid things, said things, done things, not there, there when I shouldn't have been. I mean, there's all these number of things because we're human, because we shortfall, because we don't necessarily learn from our mistakes immediately. I think the difference is I've always been there and I keep coming back. And even when I screw up, I'm willing to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to do better next time. I think that's very important, not just to your spouse, but to your children and that you invest the time. Now, one of the other things that Steve Farrar talked about is the notion of quality versus quantity. And basically the idea is how do you define quality and can you really have quality without quantity because you have nothing to base how good it is versus another time? I think that's a fair way to look at it. So I'd like to think I'd like to think that I put enough time aside. I'd like to think that I invested enough time, but I can never really know. I, I don't think any parent will ever really know until you get grandkids, right? And at some point in the future, I'll have grandkids and I'm going to invest as much time as I possibly can because hopefully I won't be working 50, 60 hours a week and I won't be running around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to get things done and stay on top of things because I will have met a point in my life where I have a certain amount of success, a certain amount of stability, a certain amount of money squirreled away. Certain things are in order and there's plans. And then guess what? I can take care of my extended family. I can be there in a way that I wasn't able to be there as a parent. Much like this played out in uh, other families, right? When the grandparents are around and they can help with the children, which would be their grandchildren, they can invest that time. Now, I'm very grateful that my parents, my wife's parents, they were able to invest time with my daughters. They were able to be there and do things and, quite frankly, fill some of the gaps that would have been left behind by me or, or even my wife from time to time because you can't be everywhere. You can't do everything. And it's kind of a, you know, a balancing act, right? Because there's certain times you shouldn't be there that you don't need to be there. You have to allow your kids to fail. You can't learn from your mistakes if you don't fail. Guess what? I'm guilty of that. My family loves to tell a story uh, about a certain president <laughs> that I helped uh, do something with. But look, it, it's competition. It gets into you. You want, to, you want to make sure that you're the best, meaning your kid who is living as an embodiment of you, right? You're doing things vicariously through your kids to a degree. Not always a good idea. Okay, so we, we've talked about that Point Man book, right? And if you have an opportunity to go get it, I highly recommend you purchase it and read it because it was very helpful to me way back when I read it the first time. And now that I'm going back through it again, and I noticed the kind of the underlying parallel notions here in this first couple chapters with the first couple chapters of Nehemiah. So I'm looking at that. And then at night, when I, when I uh, call it a night, I typically try to read a chapter on my Kindle. 
So I thought that it would be appropriate to go back and reread the Boniface option. It's a short book. It's Andrew Iskar. Basically the idea that uh, we as Christians, we have to be active. We as Christians, we can't just lay back. We can't go hide. We can't just ignore things around us. And his advice or his description, and again, I'm about halfway done with that book, is basically the idea that if you're not involved, if you're not doing something, if you're not pushing back, if you're not involved in your own backyard. So again, kind of going back to the idea in Nehemiah, right? Fix the problem where you're at, taking it beyond just your immediate family, your kids, and talking about the community, or perhaps maybe I'm extrapolating this out a bit, but if you're not involved in the community around you, if you're not involved in your church, if you're not involved with your children's friends through the school and whatever else, you're missing an opportunity here. You're missing the idea that we as Christians need to be active. We need to be involved. We need to be leading the charge. We need to be setting a good example. Again, those are different things that I've extrapolated out of Andrea Scar's book, right? The Boniface Option. And in, in reading that in parallel with now rereading Point Man. <laughs> and I'm not really sure, but I, I really think there's a very interesting overlap. So we've got the book of Nehemiah that was clearly written over 2,000 years ago. We've got Point Man that's Probably some of the earliest writings, probably pushing, well, let's not say 40, certainly pushing 35 years old. We've got Andrew Iskar's book, uh, which is maybe a year old, if that. And they're all saying much the same thing with different interpretations or angles. Nobody's negating the other. It's more like building on an idea. The idea is, You have to fix what's right in front of you. You have to fix and focus on fixing the thing that you can most directly affect the outcome of. So the people described in Nehemiah are focused on and fixing the part of the wall that is near their house or near their business. Perhaps their building, or I'm sorry, the building they live in or work their business out of is actually part of the wall, which was commonplace back then. They're, they're investing time, effort, money, materials into fix that part of the wall. And if everybody along the side of that wall gets involved and makes a difference, then that wall gets repaired. It gets put back in place. It gets back in order. It serves its intended purpose. Likewise, Steve Farrar is talking about the idea that we have to first, first fix our own children, particularly our sons. And if we can correct that issue we can start a generational change whereupon our grandchildren will be in a better place and perhaps our great-grandchildren. He references Jonathan Edwards and his uh, posterity that follows and all the things that they did. So I wonder, as I look at that, and then I take the Iskar view, right, where he's talking about almost an in-between situation here, being directly involved in what's going on around you. Focusing on your extended family, right? Your community, if you will. The concept that perhaps your extended family, if they don't live directly with you, but they have a closer network, a closer tie, that you build upon that, you make a difference there, and you build up your familial community. And and if everybody focuses on that, and everybody makes those changes in their direct family and their community or or a familial community, if you will, then we will see an impact and we will see that change. And if everybody works together on those same kinds of goals and changes, the outcome will be noticeable to those around us. Now, this has kind of been a passion thing for me last, I don't know, year or so, because you have seen, (laughs) probably heard, (laughs) People in real life do see me. I do talk about these things, but this is my show and I talk about this routinely. 
Focus on your community. Focus on your own back door. Focus on your church. Focus on your um, school community. Focus on your city council, perhaps even at the county level. Get engaged. Make a difference. Show up. Be involved. Be informed. Know the issues. Know the elected people. Know what's going on here. Be willing to accept that not everybody's going to go along with you on everything. Not everybody's going to be on the same page. Understand that you can do this. But you'll have to understand as you're doing this, it's actually an investment. It's something that maybe you won't see the dividend or you won't see the payoff at the end. But if you don't do it, it leads into ruin. Now, one of the larger messages if you will, behind Nehemiah is the concept that even when all is lost or ruined, you can bring it back. That if you're faithful to God, he will be faithful to you. That the changes you make, they build together and they bring about a better outcome. One of the underlying concerns I've had for, I guess, a number of years And this is not unique to me, but I hear it and I hear it all the time. And it does weigh on me to a degree. Are we at the natural end? Have these United States run their course? Is it the end times? Is it just a time of darkness to follow or approach Jesus? You know what? I don't really know the answer to those questions. Not with absolute confidence. And I'm, and I'm sure I've got listeners or people I know that would want to lecture me for hours about this, that, or the other thing. That's fine. That's fine. But what I really want to consider, and I want you to consider as my listener is, is there something that we can do to push off or to hold back the darkness? Is there something we can do to hold the line for civilization? Is there something that we can do to work together for the greater good? Is there some way to honor God so that he will honor us? Now, people like to throw out that phrase, and honestly, I don't remember where it's at. So (laughs) got a lot of things floating around in my head right now. So forgive me, I won't be able to quote it. But essentially, the idea that if the people will repent... In return to me. I will bless them. So it's real easy to turn to God. I think it's less easy to repent. And it's less easy to repent on a national scale. To be sure. And perhaps we look at it as we're the remnant, right? And everybody wants to see themselves as the remnant. I I mean, I know I do. I want to be the remnant. But the remnant actually is the one that gets stuck going through everything and seeing everything and watching these things play out and has to be faithful. So you sure that's what you want? Well, that's a fair question. So if we repent of our evil ways, of our bad things that we're doing, saying, believing, however you want to phrase it, if, if, we, if we turn from that and return to God, he's going to bless us. I mean, he tells us that in his word. And yes, I'm paraphrasing. So look, I... I Spare me. The concept is you'll be blessed if you return to him. But in order to return to him, you have to repent. That's the biggest concern I have. I don't really see a whole lot of repentance. I I, I see a whole lot of celebration of pride. One of the seven deadly sins, by the way. I see a lot of, how do I want to say it? embracing of things not of God. And look, I'm not innocent here. I have my own shortcomings. I have my own failings. I'm not necessarily looking to judge the whole world. But I am using a little discernment. I mean, it's quite clear that we're doing things that are not good, that they fly in the face. And if we say we're Christians, right, 70% approximately of the people in these United States claim to be Christian or self-identify as Christian. Well, if you're going to do that, you probably ought to know what it is that's expected of you if you're a Christian. 
And if I tell you the watered down version, if I tell you the nice, nice version, if I tell you that Jesus is love and nothing else matters, I'm not really doing you any favors. But again, I can't fix the world. I can't fix everything outside of my sphere of influence. But what I can impact, what I can do is start with my own family. Start with my extended family or move on to my extended family. Then work on the community around me. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is consider the same way. How do you do that? How do you make that change? Now, if you treat people poorly all the time, doesn't matter. They're not going to listen to a word you say. But if you're honest and you're faithful about it and you don't bash them upside the head about it, perhaps they might notice. Well, that guy's not just like us. Now, I just read an article earlier this week about a basketball player by the name A.C. Green. Now, I got to be honest. He was a Laker. I don't know anything about it. But I do remember hearing the name A.C. Green. I do remember hearing that he was a devout Christian. And when I was reading about this article, how the other players would mock him when they were going out finding girls and he was practicing or doing something else, I couldn't help but think to myself about the fact that he stayed true to his priorities. He stayed true to his faith. And every one of those players that mocked him respected him for it. That was the takeaway. Perhaps it would be helpful to you to remember the more that people mock you, the more they dismiss you and what you believe and how you say it, as long as you're doing it properly, they're actually probably respecting you they're 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 not happy with the way you make them feel or the way you make them look there's a certain amount of respect and envy and play there envy of course being one of those other seven deadly sins so i'm asking you we say we want independence we say we want to do What's best? We want to protect these United States. In the context of that, does the second part of this conversation make sense? Do you understand why I'm talking about this? Does this ring any bells? Because if you want independence, if you want liberty, it also requires responsibility. So the first part of this talk today was on the concept of liberty, right? Of independence, freedom. The second part really was all about the responsibilities. What's involved. The two go hand in hand. Don't forget that. And as we go into this long weekend, and I will make a Friday episode because I think I'm going to make that my independence day episode, if you will, so to speak. I want you to consider the correlation between liberty and responsibility. And with that, this has been According to Callus, and I will see you on the other side.